Last but not least, I want to introduce our moderator for this evening. Susan Shapiro um, is a journalist, editor, and author of both fiction and nonfiction, and a professor at NYU and at the New School. Please welcome Sue Shapiro. Is this on? Yeah. Wanted to thank everybody for coming, and uh, especially, especially yeah, Al, who um, lets me drive her crazy with these panels a lot, which uh, which we love, and I'm an NYU grad, so um, and it's right across the street, so she's geographically desirable. And I also really want to thank David Marno, who I know from the National Book Critics Circle, who's taping this panel for us tonight. So if you have any friends or colleagues out of town, they could um, watch it. And um, I'm also an ASJA member, so it's going to be on um, the ASJA website. So I thought what I would do is um, let me introduce each of the panelists and tell you about their books um, as we start. So um, Andy Avila um, is over here. And I met Andy. She's an editor at Berkeley Books, which is um, uh, part of uh, Viking Penguin, one of the biggest book publishers in the world, I think, and she is the editor of this fantastic anthology that I'm in called Wedding Cake for Breakfast, Essays on the Unforgettable First Year of Marriage. So I'm Andy Avila, and, and if you don't mind, Andy, would you tell us a little bit about um, your work at uh, Viking Penguin and what kind of books you do? Um, yeah, so I have been a nonfiction editor primarily for the last 10 years. Um, and this book in particular took on like special meaning because typically as a nonfiction editor, you're thinking about what the marketplace um, can sustain, what would be viable, what people are looking to read. And rarely it's about, is it about you? And in this case of this essay anthology, um, I was looking for something just like this that spoke to what the first year of marriage is like because my first year of marriage wasn't quite what I expected it to be. It was great, but um, my adorable husband was laid off in the 2009 market crash, and so um, that just created all kinds of interesting scenarios that I just wasn't expecting. And so um, for the first year of marriage, I thought, you know, a lot of people enter um, marriage with certain expectations and a lot of moments in life with certain expectations and um, partnering up with the Wendy Sherman and Kim Perel, who you'll hear from, was really great and it was a great experience working on this. Fantastic. And um, next to her is Beth Bernstein, who um, is a former student of mine and I'm very proud to say that this is the first book event she's ever done for her beautiful memoir, My Charm Life, which comes out in two weeks. And, um, and Beth, why don't you tell us a little bit, because um, there's so many students that come to my panels, I think what would be especially helpful is, could you tell us a little bit about, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, you sold this book, this is your first book, and you, um, after doing a lot of newspaper magazine work, you sold it based on a proposal. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, so um, I basically was Sue's potting, um, wrote a proposal um, which included an outline, and actually I wrote shorter chapters, so it was about six chapters. I think you could usually sell a proposal on three or four chapters for a memoir, um, but I sold mine on six, and um, it was very serendipitous. Um, Sue introduced me to an editor. Sue also offered me her agent, and everything just became <laughs> wonderful. And actually, there was a there was a cooler story because I think the first agent that liked it was another former student yes. student of mine, Nicole Robson. And didn't she like go crazy yeah, she over went it? Crazy the first it, yeah. agent she ever sent it to was like, oh my god. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, it was one of the first books that Nicole sold as an agent. Yes, it was. Yes. Very happy story. It was a really happy story. It was all beautiful, really beautiful, and it's all due to Sue. So, and you have all these book events coming up. Yeah, I have lots of book events coming Good. up. I have a sheet here for later. Fantastic. Okay, and next to Beth is Jack Murnahan, who I met because he's an editor at Babbel.com, which is this fantastic website that a lot of my students um, wanted to know about. In fact, actually, I think Bonnie Bernstein might have been the first. You you got published there. I think you were the first person. I'm like. This is cool. Wait a second. Who's your editor? What's their email? 
And, um, and so I asked Jack if he would come and speak to one of my um, new school panels, and he did, and he was fantastic. And then I heard that he had um, a book himself out called Much Ado About Loving, what our favorite novels can teach you about dating expectations, not so great Gatsby's, and love in the time of internet personals. So Jack, could you tell us a little bit about, um, about your book? Sure, um, I co-wrote this book uh, with Maura Kelly, who um, had blogged from Marie Claire for a long time. And it came about because I, I, I've written a number of books about reading great literature for pleasure. And I've written about sex and relationships a lot, sometimes for Pete's Magazine nerve. Um, and Laura is a friend of mine, and she, she would frequently come to me and we would sort of discuss our various dating woes and whose woes were more woeful than the other's woes. <laughs> um, and she claims that, that, that I couldn't stop myself from constantly going to my bookshelves and pulling down something and reading her a passage regardless of what it was we were talking about. So she finally said to me, um, you should write a book about sort of, you know, what wisdom you can get from the great books in love and, uh, regarding love and dating. So that's, we effectively did it together. And we, the, the most fun part of the book was coming up with the, the chapter titles because they're all puns. Things like um, Rabbit Run Screaming, The Problem of Boredom and Marriage, Madame Hovery, is cheating ever okay? <laughs> Mana Karenda, what if a lover just drops from the sky? So it, 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 was, it was fun to try to figure out books that were, you could pun on the title that reflected the actual content that you wanted to write about and that there were illustrative scenes within the book. So we had a good time. And can you tell us a little bit about Babel and what they might be looking for? It's, it's, it, it's um, usually with um, kids, right? Yeah, so Babel's a kind of smart uh, parenting website, which you might, it might sound like an oxymoron to you, but it's not. Uh, You've seen things like Baby Center, it's a little painful. So we, we publish really honest, real, personal essays about parenting and, and its imperfections and the fact that it doesn't correspond to the kind of pink and pastel blue portrayal of it uh, in most of the media. So if you're a parent and you've never had a problem at all, it's okay, write a story about it for us and uh, you'll find some community. Great, and um, next to me, to my right, actually these two are um, fantasy panelists for me because not only are they fantastic, um, Kim Perel here and Wendy Sherman, they have an anthology they put me in and they're literary agents. So could there be more perfect panelists in the history of the world because all of my students need literary agents, right, for all their new books. And, um, and, and the way to their heart is to buy their book and get them to sign it. And then, by the way, I happen to have my own book that I'm working on. Anyway, so um, Kim, can you tell us a little bit about, so you're a literary agent and then this is your debut. So is it cool being on the other side? Um, yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I, I did this book with Wendy and Andy, and um, it's really interesting being on the other side, because Wendy and I would often say, um, uh, at the office, we, we talk about it, and you think you know, as an agent, you think you know what it's like to have it be your book, your name, you know, um, and you really think that you put yourself in, you know, in, in your client's shoes, but you don't really know until you do it. So um, I think it was really eye-opening and really interesting to, um, you know, go through the all the channels, you know, the first past pages, or like, you know, getting the getting the cover art and it being your, you know, kind of name on it. So it was a very unique and eye-opening experience. And we, we keep saying every agent should be authors at some point, so they would know. Now I, now I know that you guys did um, my student Claire Bidwell Smith's beautiful memoir. Um, the Rules of Inheritance. But do you also like do you do fiction and nonfiction as an agent? Uh, yeah, we, we try and do about half and half fiction and nonfiction as, as agents, and um, we, we love both equally, I think, um, and we just, we just kind of assess things on project by project basis. basis so. Great, and um, Wendy, I'd like to hear you know, how you feel being a, um, a well-known literary agent for so long, and then all of a sudden having your first book um, come out. What does it feel like? Well, it was a little terrifying, actually, because like, we've been doing this for so long as agents, and I was a publisher before I was an agent, and then to be an author, to be putting a book together, to be waiting to see what the publisher came up with for a cover, to be waiting for a phone call from the editor, it was just very, um, it was very exciting and a little scary, and as Kim said, I think it's, it's sort of changed our view, it's certainly changed my view, and I've certainly been doing this a lot longer than Kim has obviously, but it, it just suddenly you're on the other side of it, and I think it's made me much more sensitive to how it feels to be an author, to be so dependent on other people, to put your book in the hands of someone else. I mean, people trust us with their book as agents, but then we were on the other side, and um, 
I just think it's made us better agents I com completely understand the process from a different perspective. And um, while we have you here, I'm under the impression that um, not only is it better to get a literary agent before you go to a publisher, but also I've been told that if you're going to write a novel, you write the entire novel. But if you're going to write nonfiction, a lot of times you could get away with a 30 to 70 page proposal. Uh, I actually think, well, for fiction, yes, you need to write the entire, the entire book. The entire book. Uh, for nonfiction, I think you know 50 pages is the maximum, and that would include the proposal part of it, which is the part that tells the publisher or the agent, in my case, what the book is going to be about and how you're going to market it and who your competition might be or your comparisons might be in the marketplace. All of that marketing stuff goes up front, but I don't really think that if for most nonfiction, I wouldn't think you need more than 25 to 30 pages, sometimes I think, Andy, don't listen to this, but I think less is more because it's less for people to read and perhaps have questions about. So kind of just get the point across in the, the most expeditious way. Great, okay, so next to us is Devin Cipher, who um, is a brilliant critic, who for years I know because we do a writing group together, and. Um, and he's written for um, the New York Times wedding section, a lot of fantastic vows pieces. And, um, and I know he's a great ghost editor, and he's going to be teaching his first class memoir, How to Tell Your Story, over the summer. But um, just recently, he's had very exciting news, which is his first novel, um, his autobiographical funny first novel, The Wedding Beat, just came out. So Devin, can, similar to the agents, how does it feel being on the other side now instead of helping other people uh, get their books published? It's, uh, it's definitely uh, an interesting flip around to be on the other side, and especially as a reporter, to be interviewed as opposed to be interviewing people is, um, is a little bit unsettling. Um, Stan speaking here now, it's, uh, it's, um, I'm used to being able to be you know, silent after asking probing and questions. So, <laughs> um, so but it's fun. It's, uh, I'm having a good time. Great, and um, next to Devin is Peter Smith, who's an editor of this, another fantastic website that does a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and my students love, and they get published in Nerve.com. So Peter, could you tell us a little bit about Nerve.com and maybe what you might be, um, he, he mentioned to my class when he came recently that they're open for sex stories, so I'm getting very uh, raunchy um, email pitches from my students, and I think a couple of them already got caught in the spam filter, but so tell us a little bit about uh, Nerve.com. I wouldn't want to overstate the case on that. We're sort of, the tagline now is love, sex, culture, and it's really about the intersection of those three things. Um, it used to be much more sex focused, um, so nothing X-rated at the moment, although God knows that could change again. Um, but more stuff about relationships, um, pop culture, you know, trying to stay away from the sort of maxim cosmopolitan view of you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, we don't really subscribe to that. Um, we're trying to get to something that's more truthful and, and more authentic and uh, more modern, maybe. And actually, you mentioned that you guys do not only 1,500 word um, sexy essays and pop culture stuff, but you also tell them about that great column that I love that's very romantic that you did one of. Yes, uh, we have a column where writers interview their parents about how they got together or a, you know, a story from their courtship. Um, and those are super sweet. So if you want to interview your parents, uh, we're listening. Great. OK, so we call this the Writing About Love and Passion panel. So I think we should get raunchy right away and talk about what is it like publishing stuff about sex and love and passion, because um, sometimes you, you know it's difficult and you can get into trouble, um, just so that you know that I'm not going to make everybody else embarrass themselves, and I won't. Um, my family hates everything I've ever written, and um, in Five Men Have Broke My Heart, which is my breakout book, my parents were absolutely appalled that I mentioned I'd had two abortions. They're still not over it 10 years later, although they came to the book party. But when they came to the book party, they huddled with all of our crazy Jewish relatives, and I heard them say, you know, how are you holding up? Are you okay? As if they were coming to sit shiva. Um, and then also my husband hates everything I write about him, and um, I, I was in a recent sex anthology, and he was like, why the hell would you say yes to that? And I'm like, because I got offered $1,000. And he's like, I will give you $2,000 to not get published. <laughs> anyway, so, so um, Andy, I'm curious, was there anything um, in, in terms of editing Wedding Cake for Breakfast, was there any subject that was taboo? Or did, was it, um, did, you know, could you swear? Could you, I mean, there's some really sexy, funny 
wild pieces? Was that was there a, a rating system or anything? So, like Wendy, Kim, and I, we kind of had this cookie cutter idea of what like the essays would be, and as they came in one by one, it was pretty amazing how like the perspectives just completely varied. The voices were so different, and just the layers to which they approached this topic. Like you're talking about one year of marriage, how many different angles can you take? And everyone had like a different lens that they examined this year with and it was fascinating and we didn't want people to hold back so like I think we did have a conversation about Jenna McCarthy's like yeah. cursing she, she, yeah she wrote to me and she asked if blow and she was like can I she, she said can I say blow job and I said of course you can yeah no I think we uh -huh. I mean she, she asked you know a lot of questions can I and by the way if that was you know the New York Times okay. Daily News or, or any other publication you couldn't but I think books are more open now. I remember um, you guys allowed me to change the name of my husband. That's one of our tricks. Is that he has a, I, I kept my name, so when I write about him, um, I use a pseudonym. And it seems to me that you're allowed to do that in books, whereas a lot of newspaper and magazine editors don't allow you to do that. And in your experience with other nonfiction, are there people? If it's a little bit out there, can people change names? Yes, um, you can change names, and I mean you create. Um, that that often happens, like, I'm probably going to give more information than I need to, but there's releases that publishers give to authors writing nonfiction, and you need to get them signed by people who you've interviewed, and it's unlike the newspaper, business, and magazine side of publishing. Um, you just don't want to run into any sorts of situations. So without a release, you really can't, don't have right to, to copyright, and you could have false light um, situation come up. So you create composites, come up with Yeah, and I was actually told um, with this book um, from my Random House lawyer, I was told that um, in order to win a lawsuit, if somebody wanted to sue me for writing about them, they would have to prove that I lied and show malice. Um, oh, that I lied with malice intended and show damages. And so I have this trick when I'm writing about sex or love or ex-boyfriends or jerks. I always say how handsome they are at first or how brilliant they are. Because you can't really, the, the lawyer told me, it's really hard to prove malice if there's a sentence about, you know, oh my God, they're so handsome and fantastic and hot and buff. Even if they later turn out to be a sociopath, if you start with how great they are, um, so um, do you have a lawyer, a publishing lawyer, that goes through, um, vets your material? Yes. I mean, not everything is vetted. Um, as an editor, you just learn like what material to send to them, um, sometimes the full manuscript, sometimes just the parts that you're concerned about. Uh, but it's, it's definitely something you need to keep in mind when you're doing this, um, just writing nonfiction consider the light that you're covering someone in and just how they may respond to it. Or the other option is, of course, you just make it fiction. Right. We're going to tell, tell Devin's secret of how he got away with getting into trouble. Okay, so Beth Bernstein, um, now in your book, My Charm Life, and I call this the, um, the love lost and what I wore for jewelry, Beth basically talks about every loss in her life through a piece of jewelry, including a lot of jerks that you dated. And I actually know um, that um, one of the exes um, that was mentioned in the book wound up in the Publishers Weekly rave, um, but the reviewer didn't necessarily interpret your story the way you would have wanted to. So this is your first debut book. Is it already embarrassing to have it to have your personal life out there? And it was a six-year relationship. And is that is that already a little dicey? Um, it was a little dicey because he didn't know about it yet, um, and I wanted to tell him before because I, she just reviewed my book as opposed to interviewing me about it, and she basically said that I kicked him to the curb, and he's actually here tonight, so I didn't actually kick him to the curb, so yeah, it was a little bit, um, yeah, exactly, um, so it's a little, it was a little bit shocking for me, although it was a great review of the book. 
Exactly right. Yeah. So Shady Friedman, by the way, a former student. Yeah, that was a great review of the book. But um, and um, yeah. So have you shown any of the other exes the book or emailed um, them about it? Um, yes, um, because I actually am friends with a lot of my exes. Um, so I have. But um, basically, this one ex um, saw his chapters before they went to press. So. Um, and you know he was fine with them. He actually helped me with the feeling on them, so it was cool. One of my exes in the book um, read it and never spoke to me again, and my husband suggested I do the same with all the rest of the exes. <laughs> okay, Jack. So, um, so you you yourself write about sex and love, and also babble. So, have you ever had any situations where um, you know it's it's hard to put your own personal story out there? Um, I mean, I wrote a column for Nerve for four years called uh, Jack's Naughty Bits, where I did a, a weekly essay about sex and literature, and they were always personal essay based. Um, so unfortunately, uh, you know, the funny thing is, um, I never I never wrote about anybody in a way that they would be able to identify themselves. That was my trick. But then instead- Could you tell how you would do that? Change um, names, change personal details? Um, normally, it would, it would, I tend to do a composite. So it's sort of maybe one detail from one person, you know, one detail from another. You know, life does repeat itself. And the mistakes I make, I make, I make them again and again. So I, <laughs> I tend to have a lot of similar material um, that involves different, unfortunate ladies. So, uh, so that 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 was one trick. I mean, the amusing flip side of that though is that then then they would say, oh, I just read that piece you wrote about me, and I was thinking, I'm thinking to myself, it wasn't about you. Uh, but they always thought that it was, and sort of an accompaniment. Now, what about kids? Uh, I do have kids. I know, but um, when you write about parenthood or whatever, are you ever worried? Is that a whole other thing that you don't oh, want to yeah, put right. anything out there about, like a negative aspect of fatherhood when when your kids could grow up to read the material? Yeah, I have a strange situation that I help my lesbian friends have two sons, and so they're a little hesitant to, to, to have me write about them at all, um, just because of their, their community. And their so have party. you agreed to not write about it? No, I, I've written about them a little bit, but, it, but, um, but again, always in a way where they couldn't be Googled. I think that that's pretty important, and you know, I refer to them as, uh, as you know, I refer to my son Oscar uh, as Ollie, and you know, I do things like that. So that makes it a little bit easier. So if I, you know, if I told you about the essay, you would know who I was referring to, but someone else can't find it on the internet. Yeah, what about on Babel? Like I have a student, Helene Olin, who did a piece for um, the New York Times Modern Love that was on um, how she fired her nanny after reading about her nanny's sex-rated blog, and the, the New York Times editor, while fact-checking, showed her the piece. So um, and 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 luckily they they uh, let it run anyway. But so does that ever happen at um, Babbel.com where you either have to fact check or where somebody is disgruntled after they've been written about or anything like that? I would like to say that for a website we fact check as much as any website. <laughs> <laughs> so no no horrible problems. No one on staff. No. No, no do you ever find yourself like with breastfeeding and, and sex after childbirth and stuff? Do you ever wind up um, having to tone it down? Is there any um, line that you can't cross? Well, I will. We were bought by Disney um, a year ago, so that has changed things a tiny bit. But the funny thing is, only a tiny bit. They they still kind of let up. They, part part of the thing about Babel was it was launched by the same people who launched Nerve, and they wanted to have the same intrepid spirit and honest approach, and they they did sex first and parenting after both as, as topics that seem to have a lot of gloss over them and a lot of idealization and a lot of taboos and they just want to go in the face of those taboos and that, that's how they built those brands and that's why they're interesting websites. So they've been, we've been able to stay true to that mission even having been bought by Disney so I'm sort of proud of that. Cool. Now Kim, um, I know you're a writer and you're also an agent and now you're an editor so is it easier to publish other people's sexy stuff than it is to write about your own personal life have you found so far? Um, yes, definitely. It's much easier to publish other people's. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting, everyone talking about, you know, Nerve and Babel, and, and we, we kind of wanted the same thing for a wedding cake, you know, take the gloss off of something that, you know, everyone thinks is, you know, always thought to be rosy and, and everything. So we wanted it to be very real. And um, I, I actually, I wrote the introduction to the book, and I wrote it about a friend of mine and who I was very afraid for her to read it. And um, it, it wasn't terrible, you know, but it, it was about her, and you know, I didn't ask her. So um, she read it, and she loved it, and she said, who's it about? <laughs> so um, people often don't see themselves. Um, it, 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 it's it's um, interesting. Um, I've heard lots of stories like that, um, where people often don't see themselves in your work anyway. So you're sitting there worried about it and, you know, restraining yourself, you know, in this, with the this story that you want to tell. But actually, the other person's out there, 
you know, blissfully unaware. So. <laughs> Um, Wendy, um, was there any pieces that were, um, you know, that you felt were too X-rated or too raunchy, or did you were you did you want a sexy book? And also, do you um, uh, do you agree with me that um, in books, really, there isn't as much limitation as there would be in newspapers and magazines in terms of writing about sex? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to newspapers and magazines, but I think in books, you know, I pretty much I don't feel there's much restriction today. I have yet to see a publisher come back to me and say got to take out this word or this scene is too raunchy but that also might be the kind of stuff that we represent. The book had some pretty you know there was a lot of sex drugs and rock and roll at yeah. different points and, yes. and so so for the memoirs and novels that you've done would you say they're closer to like rated R? Well uh, no. <laughs> I mean we, versus it, X yeah, versus no, there's uh, no X. I mean there's no X. We're, I mean, we're not you know that's not that's not what we're doing. That's not to say other people. It's a big bestseller now by the um, shades, shades of gray. Yeah, you don't do shades of gray. Well, I wish we did. <laughs> <laughs> I would be very happy to represent that book at this point. But I, you know, I think that people. I think as agents, I think you represent the kind of material that you personally respond to as a reader. So the kind of material that I respond to probably is more about a, you know a wonderful heartwarming story or something really emotional or something that resonates with me as a person, whether it's as a woman or a parent or a wife or a professional, whatever it is, a friend, it's like something in that story touches me. And I always feel if it touches me, it's gonna to touch you. So, you know, we're really just readers. As agents, we're the first, I guess we're the first gatekeepers as readers. And with memoir, I, when I read a great memoir, I feel like Sometimes I'm reading it and I forget that it's nonfiction and I feel like I'm being swept into a novel. And that to me is because the voice just takes me away someplace and suddenly I'm in someone's life and I, the, the lines are fuzzy to me at times. And yeah, I once had an editor say to me when I was trying to figure out whether to call Five Men a novel or a memoir, because I changed stuff, she said to me, a novel that is merely autobiographical is a great disappointment, but a memoir that reads like a novel is a great surprise. That's so true, that is so true. Okay, so Devin, um, Devin is a 40-something journalist who writes w about weddings for the New York Times, and by interesting coincidence, Gavin, the, the protagonist of his first novel, The Wedding Beat, is a 40-something uh, Manhattan uh, guy who writes for the New York Times. Now, was that a conscious decision that you do not want to write in first person um, about your personal life, so you fictionalized it? It, it was a conscious decision. Gavin is also a young man, but in any case, um, or I'm younger. Um, but um, the, having written for the Times, I think the hardest part of writing, I wrote for the Vows column for about five years um, before I started the book. And the hardest part was telling people stories, interviewing them, getting their details of their entire lives, and their entire romantic lives, and they would share things with me that don't necessarily belong in public, but they trusted me, and they, that would make the stories come alive, was that they would share with me. I had psychotherapists saying it was like having therapy sessions. And then I had to very carefully choose what information I had to illuminate them enough so that the stories felt fully dimensional without revealing things that would leave them really regretting having talked with, spoken with me. So there was no, even though people came to me and asked me to write a memoir, and I had edited memoirs, I didn't feel comfortable with that being an option. And yet, um, I did want to capitalize on the work I'd done at the Times, and I wanted to come up with another project. So it did occur to me that if I do what I do, which is write about weddings, um, if it wasn't my life, it would be much more amusing to somebody else that this single guy is writing about weddings, and I thought it would be more protected that if I can go and share the feelings so I call it emotionally true, but the plot is made up. And, and, um, and I remember a big scandal with the vows column because Devin once did a piece on two people who were getting married who when they first met were married to other people. And people just went crazy. And do you find, um, do people get very emotionally involved with the, the vows column? And is there, have you done any other, has there been any other pieces that wound up kind of scandalous? People, um, people are involved. The photographer for that story is actually here tonight. And um, it's, um, we know it was, it, that was very intense. We had news reporters around the world covering this scandalous idea that two people divorced and remarried. 
Um, you know, and yes, they didn't know each other while they were married, but it's, it was fascinating, the hate mail I got. And what was particularly fascinating was how much came from men. I expected it more from women, and it was mostly men very offended that someone got away with this. <laughs> and clearly it wasn't them. But, um, and, and that was kind of, that was actually disappointing, and I think, um, and sp spoke ill of their relationships, I think, more than anything else. Um, mostly I get really beautiful commentary from people. People are um, hopefully inspired by hearing about other people. I try to find interesting stories in the book, in the fiction, and in real life, when I choose stories. I like stories of people who have done interesting things. The, the people who, you know, did meet and it took 30 years to get together. And, and one of my favorite stories is a woman, she's cleaning out her closet after um, a divorce and she finds love letters from the guy she broke up with 30 years ago, who turns out recently lost his wife. Oh, Michelle. And, you know, yeah. Um, now that actually, that was something someone else. But actually, that's someone else, a friend, someone Sue knows. Um, she met her husband while in a divorce court. When he was uh, they questioning her on the stand, he was the attorney, the defense lawyer for her ex. And they had this tumultuous relationship, finally got married. Um, and a very sad, beautiful coda, though, um, is I contacted her when my book came out. I contacted a lot of the couples and let them know. And she informed me she had lost her husband. And they'd only been married, I think, maybe two years. Yeah, and actually the sweet thing about it was they had first met and fallen in love in college. They first met and fell in love in college, but it didn't work out. So at least they did at the end. They well, wound she, she up. Was, she was in college. She, yeah. She was already a lawyer. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. She finally, she finally at least had, had some time with her, the love of her life, she called her. Yeah, and, and she still writes. He had a column he wrote for the local paper down south. And she continued writing the column. Um, and, and, and she keeps his spirit alive, and she has written some really beautiful things that she shared with me. And she said how important it was to her to have her story out there, because they had so little time together, and that process of sharing it. So putting things out there in a nonfiction format, even though I chose fiction, um, is very powerful. Um, and, and she felt so much that in her mourning of her relationship, that, that the story was public, and that people did see it, and that she had been able to share it, um, meant so much to her, and um, and it was moving to me having her share that with me. Great, and uh, Peter, you actually said to my class recently that um, Nerve.com used to be raunchier, and that it took a turn, like Jack at um, Babel, it took a turn for a little bit um, less X-rated. Um, what, so, what was the change? Do you think? Uh, I think it was a gradual evolution. I mean, um, you wouldn't believe some of the things that Jack used to write. That's true. <laughs> tell us. Tell us. But uh, you'll have to look for yourself. Have to Google it. Um, I, I think we had gotten to a point where charting every uh, little tributary of human sexuality was starting to feel repetitive, and where like the new fetish was the same as the old fetish. Um, it sort of started to feel academic, so we wanted to bring in stuff that was more about relationships, bring in stuff that was more about pop culture. Um, that felt a little breezier. I guess. Could you tell us like one of the old stories that caused a scandal? Did you ever have like people complaining or, yeah, I'm not going to read this anymore because it's too raunchy? Uh, actually, uh, Jack would feel that one a little better. <laughs> he was he was editor in chief. Yeah, I don't think I can say it out loud either. <laughs> well, we published JT Leroy, who did create quite a scandal. You know this you know this story. So uh, so JT Leroy came to us ostensibly as a. 15 year old kid whose mom had worked as a um, as a prostitute in truck stops. I mean, it's called like a what's it, something lizard, right? Uh, it's a, I don't know. Lizard? La lizard, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the fiction was fantastic and it was really intense and really graphic. Um, but the, the author is very strange because you couldn't get him on the phone and supposedly had never been seen in public except, except with this entourage that kind of would always impede you know, between himself and the press and blah, blah, blah. And it turned out that it was a great big scandal. It was done by a woman writer here in the city. I don't remember her name. It was considerably okay. And she completely pulled it off. It was great. <laughs> but we were so proud that we had published this 15-year-old kid who was so amazing and so raunchy <laughs> and had such a crazy story. And we, were, we bought it hook, line, and sinker. And I still have all my old emails from him. And, 
Okay. okay, so in case you don't know, nonfiction, you can't lie. You're going to get in trouble if you lie. So fiction, you can do anything you want. Um, but, but we don't encourage that. Right. Okay, so I'm going to ask a few more questions and then we'll open it up for questions from everyone. So I want to hear some smart advice because I know um, almost everybody in the audience that I know wants to do a book or has done a book or wants another one, so or, or wants to get published. So Andy, um, since you're the only book editor here, um, uh, could you give advice um, to uh, people that are starting out um, you know, and, and might want to do a book, and, and do you agree with Wendy that in general, if you want to write a novel, that you would write a whole novel, but if you want to do a nonfiction book, you could sell a nonfiction book based on a proposal? Write the whole novel, so that's yeah. usually about 250 double space type pages. You have to write the whole thing first. Why is that? Why for fiction you have to write the whole thing for nonfiction? Well, for nonfiction, a lot of the times there's research that needs to go into it in time, and you need to be paid to be able to do that. So that's where you pitch the idea and show like what the scope would be and what you would bring to the topic. Then if someone buys it, then you can go out and do it. Lots of times it's, it's, um, it just involves spending a year. For example, I have a book on uh, coming out in February where this man immersed himself in a restaurant for 18 months. At the time that I bought it, he had only been there for three weeks. And for him to give up essentially 18 months of his life, he needed to know if there was a commitment. They also say that for a novel, it's all about voice, and you have to have a good voice throughout that really captures everything. Whereas I've heard a lot of editors say in nonfiction, if the story is good enough, um, it could carry the day even if there's problems in the voice. You know, if it's a dramatic story about a war veteran or something like that. Or it's very easy with nonfiction to get a ghost writer, a ghost editor involved, whereas usually with novels it's less common. Well, with nonfiction, too, I mean, I think we're thinking a lot in terms of memoir and narrative, but also there's just a felt need when it comes to nonfiction. So if you're looking at a project that comes to, you know, the category of relationships and it's about it's dating advice or if it's self-help in some sort of, you know, it's gonna go in the self-help category, you know that there's gonna be people who are gonna come to that. You know there's a marketplace in out there and people and audience that's going to go for that book. So you buy it on the idea. Um, and I kind of, I go back and forth about the idea of like less being more. I've, I've been in the situation where that is true, then lots of times it's been the reverse situation where um, there's just not enough material. You can't, it ends up feeling like a magazine article and that's the one thing you don't want to run into. You want to show that this idea that you have, the, that you're wanting to explore in book format deserves to be out there as a book. And I'll just report that for um, most of my books, including Five Men, I wrote part of it and everybody said, I don't know where it's going, it doesn't work. And, um, and I've been in therapy a long, a long enough time to know that no never means no, so I just wrote the whole book and then I sold it. So, so if you get a no um, from a proposal, sometimes if you write the whole book and it's good, then you could sell it that way, right? Yeah, no, that is true. Um, but I would say, you know, three chapters is typically, sample chapters is what I see, um, a detailed table of contents. Uh, definitely, definitely address marketplace because our job as editors when we're acquiring a project is to know how this book will set itself apart on the bookshelf, the there's very few bookshelves left, but the virtual bookshelf um, and actual bookshelf, just how it will, um, stand out and why why people will know about this book and hear about this book there's fewer review, book reviewers out there there's it's getting harder and harder harder to get um publicity for your book so what are you going to be able to bring to marketing and promoting the book um that they can also you know just leverage on your behalf, like as a publishing house, as Penguin, we're gonna go out there and we've got this book. I was just saying to Jack that I, um, one of the selling points that I often use with uh, writers who are mommy bloggers is if they write for Babbel, I always say to my sales force and marketing and publicity teams, oh, and they write for Babbel. So you know that there is this built-in audience that they have, and that's always key. 
um, in mentioning in your proposals. Great, and a perfect um, uh, segue into Beth, um, because in terms of advice, not only did you um, do a lot of um, essays and you, you've published a lot, but you're in the whole jewelry world. So you have this fantastic platform and actually you're doing quite a few events at jewelry stores. So, so would you advise somebody who's envisioning a book, should they pick um, something, a topic that they have a platform for already? Did they, do you think that that benefited you? I think it definitely benefited me that I had both worlds, that I was writing about dating and relationships for women's magazines, and that I was also in the jewelry world designing and um, writing about jewelry um, and the crossover, and then it really actually made me see how much jewelry affected my life all throughout my life. Um, it, it actually made me see that. Also, Sue pushed me to write it. Um, so <laughs> that also helped. So classes, um, taking yes, classes yes. and book seminars, that's yes. a, that helped you? Yeah, that helped me. So, um, so putting both together, definitely the platform helps. And just to show with people really come out and help you, the jewelry stores and all the jewelry retailers that I know are all giving me book readings. I have about 10. With um, you know throughout the city in, in New Jersey, so it really really did. Help. Aren't you raffling off some jewelry? Yes, yes. Um, all my jewelry designer friends um, that are great friends and really great designers have all for each event have given me a piece of a charm for my charm life to raffle off the charm. So it's all kind of tied in together. There's a, one other piece of advice I want to give um, because I think of my age as well that I mentioned in the book, which I won't mention now. But <laughs> never give up. Like do it at any age when you have an idea just do it and don't think that it, you can't do it because you're a certain age because one friend said to, I said why it took me so long to write this book they said this is the first time you tried to write a book and so really just whenever you want to do it just do it that would be the other advice I would give it's just like love great <laughs> great and um Jack, I always say, um, I, I teach these instant gratification, take too long classes, where the goal of the class is to write and, and publish a great piece by the end of the class to pay for the class. And, and actually, quite a few of my students, including Bonnie, have written for Babbel. And um, what kind of advice could you give someone maybe who doesn't have clips, um, if they wanted to write for you? Um, I, obviously, the first thing to do would be to go to the site and read Babbel really carefully. Um, what other advice would you give? Because you, you really help so many people break into, um, you know, get clips. Yeah. I. Um... I teach this with some regularity, and I always say that the, they don't have an idea before you have a venue. I think the, the most important thing to do is to, to, to kind of pick a place where you want to publish and read that, that site or that magazine. Really just read and read and read as systematically as you can until an idea comes to you. Because what will happen then is you'll be in the midst of a piece, and you'll come up with an idea for something you can do, and then your pitch letter can say, oh, I was reading such and such piece, and it made me think you'd also want a piece on this, right? Not only do you have that uh, access and that way of kind of convincing the editor that you understand their, their publication, but the, the piece that you're reading also gives you the formal model for exactly how to execute your piece so that you stay within the parameters that that site or magazine wants. You'll see the length, you'll see how funny it is, you'll see the, the treatment, and you can more or less know when, you're, when, you're, when your um, piece is ready based on whether or not it corresponds to the original comparable that you found. And um, if you don't mind me asking, like when you do a book like Much Ado About Loving, um, how long is your proposal that you write um, before that gets submitted to an agent? Uh, it's very, I mean, I've done four books, and so they're, they're shorter now. Tell us about um, how, so, so now that you have a, um, a track record, the proposals don't have to be as long? No, no, Could you tell us about your first, the first book that you sold? The first one, um, I, you see, I, I just keep looking into this uh, a little bit, but... But yeah, Probably I mean, because I, you had a platform as a Babel editor, right? Well, I, no, I had a platform as a columnist. Oh, as a columnist for Nerd. Nerd. So what was your how, first book? My first book was, uh, was called The Naughty Bits. And the so, Naughty Bits, so it was based on the based columns on the column from Nerd. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess it was my third book, which is uh, Beowulf on the Beach. That was my big life project about how to read the classics for pleasure. And that one, um, just, just as a cautionary tale, it took me five years to write the proposal. <laughs> Okay, five years to write the proposal. I, I got the first probably 85% of the proposal written in about two weeks, and then I couldn't do the rest. Until it, it got so bad that when I got back together with my ex-fiance, um, and I knew I was gonna have to go to parties and see all her friends again, and they were gonna ask me how things were going, I was gonna say, well, I'm still working on that book, and they were like, well, have you sold it? And I'd be like, well, I haven't finished the proposal. So I told her, I literally, I mean, this is a little 
sorry, but I told you, you, you're not allowed to have sex with me if I don't have this proposal done two weeks from today. Behavior modification. So yeah, so I had two weeks to finish the proposal from that from the day we got back together, and about with an hour, about an hour left, I finished it, and a week after that, I sold the book. So. And um, could you tell us about the class you teach? Oh, well, I teach a bunch of different classes, but uh, I teach at media bistro yeah, stuff. I teach personal essay writing at media bistro. I, I actually teach occasionally seminars on writing about sex, uh, and the. In two words, I would say, earn your sex scene, um, and ha don't just have it be gratuitous, and have it be honest and not idealized. Now, the success of Fifty Shades of Grey may maybe puts the lie to both of those tips, um, but uh, I thought that was the right approach. Good. And um, Kim, I remember you took a class with one of my former students, Liza Monroy. So do you think that um, taking a writing class is a good way to um, get rolling if somebody doesn't quite know what to write yet? Yeah. I. Um really good time for, I, I, I'd been working at a magazine and I had and I was kind of not really writing much of the magazine I was an editorial assistant I was it was a long time ago but um I took this class and it opened up it, that, that was kind of the beginning of everything because I met Sue's um I met uh, someone who Sue had taught um Liza who's in the anthology this is years and years later <coughs> we're still friends and she's in the anthology and it got me thinking and I met other people and from the class we had a writing group um, we all went on to MFA programs at all different schools around New York City. So um, that was, I always say, and I even said in the book, that was the beginning of, of everything, meeting Liza, taking the class, um, meeting the other people in my writing group. And then at the MFA program, I met someone who said, you love being an agent. And, um, and it all kind of... It all How did you get started? Did you intern? I did. I did. Um, I interned while I was in grad school. Um, and as... At, at the agency, and then um, and then I became an assistant, and um, and then an agent, and um, I've I've been there ever since. Since the since the day I, um, I I think I applied for the job on was it on Craigslist? I applied for the job on Craigslist on like a on like a like in the middle of the night on like a Friday night, and then I I, I interviewed on like a Monday and had the job by Tuesday, and I've been there for ever since for years and years. So. And um, Wendy, I, um, in terms of telling, trying to help people, in terms of trying to help people get agents, I always say that um, I think getting clips is a great thing, but there's also other ways that you can build up a platform. And some of my students, one just got a great um, book deal and a TV deal, uh, Kaylee Stalek, based on a blog that was called um, Granny Is My Wingman. And I had another student who did a very successful blog that's um, the, the Man Repeller. So I want to know, um, a lot of times people get nervous and they say, oh my God, how can I get a platform? But actually, um, and, and I know Alex is working on a book and he just got his first piece coming out in the New York Times tomorrow, so like that's his platform. So is there, um, and, oh and I know Diana Kirshner, who did these great um, Love in 90 Days, uh, two really sexy books, she was on a radio show that you heard her. So are there, could you talk about other ways that maybe if somebody wants to do a book that, that, that building their platform or getting more clips or getting out there could then attract an agent? Well, I think agents are so trained to look everywhere. I mean, people come to us most definitely, but I feel like every moment of my waking hour, whether I'm listening to the radio or watching TV or reading the newspaper or flipping through a, a magazine while I'm getting my nails done, you know, I feel like everything I read or listen to is somehow potential. And it's just the way my brain is wired and being an agent for so long and having been a publisher is anything I, I hear it, whether it's reading it or hearing it or seeing it, I somehow it's just something it clicks and you say, we go in the office, did you hear that or did you read this piece? Do you remember with Dr. Diana, you heard her on, it was, was, a, um, it was a radio show, was she yeah. talking about how to get love in 90, how to she, give people love in 90 days? She was taught, Dr. Diana Kirshner was talking, she was on the Joan Hamburg <coughs> show and I was on my way to work, I was listening to her talk about this philosophy she had of dating three men at a time and that you could never date just one person because it made you totally fixate on that one relationship in a way that sort of it kept you from keeping your options open and just being open-minded about things. And so I was literally speed dialing my girlfriend saying, you've got to turn on the radio. This is what I've been telling you. And so when I got to work that morning, I ran right to my computer. I turned it on. It was in like five minutes. I tracked her down. And this was years ago. I tracked her down. And I immediately wrote to her and asked her if she wanted to do a book. And of course, she had an agent already, which I was disappointed. 
But I said, if anything changes, let me know. And she came back to me um, a few months later and said, my agent and I have parted ways. It didn't work out. We didn't agree on the book. And she and I kind of fell in love with each other as an agent and an author and now as really good friends. And we've done two books together. And they've all been about her philosophies of dating. So I guess it's, it's this idea that we're marketing people on the other side and always just hungry to, to find something new that we think has a place. And Claire was, um, she was blogging and she was writing a lot of articles. Did that, um, if there was a choice of taking a memoir, a difficult memoir on with the fact that somebody has a lot of clips or that they're out there, does that, um, does that help? Absolutely, the more you're out there, the better. When we get a letter from somebody, we get a query and somebody has been published or they have a blog, or they're a columnist, or they're on the radio, whatever it is. But with something like Claire Bidwell-Smith, she was writing about something really, it was obviously very personal, but she was touching upon some very, very um, tough topics of losing both of her parents when she was very young. And, um, and, and in her case, the writing just, I mean, literally I was reading the pages in our office. We were sitting in an editorial meeting, and we're going through the, 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 the the slush pile. And I was like, oh my God, you've got to hear this paragraph. And I was driving them all crazy because I was just obsessed with this writing. And that's just, to, and in her case, she had she really written the whole thing and was going back. And she was in the MFA program at the a, um, new school. Student, yeah. Right. Yeah. But I want to go back to something we, we were talking about with how much material you have to have. And I think one of the reasons with fiction you have to have the whole thing is because is you have to know how it's going to turn out. Not every sometimes you can have a great beginning and a slow middle and a great ending, or you could it could start off great. So many times we read something and think, oh my god, this is so amazing, and then you finish it and you're sort of disappointed. So we as we have to know you can pull it off as a fiction writer, and I think there's certain types of memoir where that's true too. So when I jokingly said less is more, I think that that's a certain type of a book. And I think with certain memoir, when I sold, um, when I first read a book called Lunch in Paris by Elizabeth Bard, which um, she's also a contributor in our anthology, because I strong-armed all my clients to be in the anthology, of course, uh, she had a proposal. And I was reading, it was just a proposal. She had lived the whole life, obviously. She, she lived what she was going to write about in her book. But she hadn't, she, she was just sending me some sample material. And in that case, it had such a strong hook of an American girl going to Paris, falling in love on her first date, or that's not true, having sex on her first date. <laughs> and then um, in what was actually five years later, but in her book was one year later, she married him. And actually she's now working on her next book, which is about moving to Provence with her husband and new baby. But in that case, she had kind of had to, she, it, now she's living it before she can write about it. But in the case of Lunch in Paris, she really just had written a proposal. And in Claire's case, she had written the whole book. It's just, it has to do with how much you need to convey, how much you need to have to convey what you're, what you're trying to convey to the reader. Great, and um, Devin, I, um, Devin is a really tough critic, and, uh, and he's worked as a ghost editor, and um, I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, sometimes when I look at my classes and I think 50% of the students in my classes get published and I always try to figure out who is getting published and who isn't. And okay, so it's the people who show up to class and hand in the assignments and, and send it out. But also if I had to pick one other thing, I think it's the students who are willing to listen to and embrace and take criticism and rewrite. I think that makes a humongous difference and maybe that, maybe that explains it right there. And with my own work after I write something, I pay ghost editors to line by line edit um, the material before I give it to agents. And in the case of Five Men Who Broke My Heart, um, it, it's a big secret because many, many well-known writers do it, but I like to talk about it. And um, Five Men Who Broke My Heart, I remember I spent $2,000 on a ghost editor, which I thought was astronomical. And then my first advance was 50,000, and then I got eight other books and uh, seven foreign rights and three film deals off of it. And it was just basically the best money I've ever spent. And so I always say if you could take a class or afford a ghost editor, and there's great ghost editors for um, short pieces, and, and I know Devin has done it for books. So would you agree, and I know you're teaching a memoir class, would you agree, Devin, that being able to hear and take criticism um, you know, could be the trick that unlocks somebody who maybe their first drafts aren't so good? Well, I think, I think the key thing is finding smart, honest, 
sane people to give you feedback. <laughs> and, and, and the sane part is really helpful, but the smart and honest part is more important. Um, it's, um, it's, really, it's really important that you, it's one, there's two parts, I think, of the artistic process. One part is you need to be able to unlock yourself and release what you want to get out and have it and convey it in a way that represents on the page what you're feeling inside. And, but then once you do that, how do you shape what you put on the page so that it, it conveys to someone else the same thing it means to you? And, and I think what Wendy just said is key, is that structure and ha knowing can, you can get something down at the beginning, how do you get it to the end? How do you make sure that through the whole piece you are bringing the reader with you? And that is where having another set of eyes that you trust can really help. And I have worked with Sue and I've worked with a lot of authors. Um, it's, 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 it's an important thing to find someone in your life. And whether it be somebody, whether it be a class, whether it be someone you work with one-on-one, -on -one, whether it just be a good friend that you just really trust, you want to get feedback before you put the material out. Because you can get someone to look at your material. You can get Wendy to pick that piece up from the slush pile. But you get one shot. You only get one shot. And she's going to read five pages. And if you don't hold her in the five, ten pages, I'm speaking for you, and I don't even know her. But, uh, <laughs> but she's, I'm assuming, never use the word assume. Um, but you read five, ten pages, if you don't hold that person, that agent, that editor, it's over. It's over. And for example, one paragraph, yeah. Um, I, I've had editors from the New York Times who say two lines. Um, now, Devin, you're going to be teaching a memoir class, so if people are going to bring in pages of their um, the beginning of their memoir to your class, are you going to critique it? Is that an important part of the beginning process, do you think? I, I think it's, it's, most, it's not so much critiquing it as, um, as helping people figure out what they have and what they do not have, and how, what, if what they have represents what they're trying to do. A key thing also is when you're getting feedback, Never get, never run for the hills if someone starts telling you how you should write your book, okay? It should be your book, your article. It has to be what you're trying to say. What someone can do is help you say it the best way you can say it. Some people get tempted, you know, to want to rewrite it for you their way, and you have to be able to tr know the difference, and it's hard sometimes, because if you're getting feedback that you need to rewrite, that can just mean, well, they don't know what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is brilliant, and they just don't appreciate it. So it is hard to draw that line between when someone's just giving you feedback how to improve your writing and when someone is trying to rewrite you a different direction. And you have to have faith in who you're getting feedback from and faith in yourself. But it is about its tools. There's a toolbox. There are things you can do to help yourself. There are things you can do on every page and every paragraph. Please write, it really is one paragraph. I say five, ten pages, but you, the first paragraph, I decide do I want to keep reading or not. And, um, and in my own work, too, when I write a newspaper article, for God's sakes, one paragraph, they're on to the next article. You know? So you have to have the tools, and there are, there are rules. There are things you can do in terms of there are questions I ask myself every page Every paragraph. Wait, do tell the David Mamet line. That the I the David Mamet for. questions. Okay. He taught what, me this. Yes. What does the per character want? How badly do they want it? Why do they want it now? And what is stopping them from getting it? There's a famous David Mamet email about it that saying that, but that is the rules of every type of writing. Speech writing, novel writing. So it's, I, I, write, I, wrote, I have it over, over my desk, actually. So if it's an essay, um, uh, a memoir, or, um, or a novel, every chapter, who wants what from whom, what happens if they don't get it, why now? Why now? And you ask yourself that question. So, And the other thing I would say that, um, if, tell me if you agree with this, a lot of mistakes I say with um, especially people that want to get into like modern lover lives, um, or uh, uh, the New York Times op-ed, or you know any kind of first-person writing or novel, is that there's not enough drama, conflict, tension, and it does seem like, like for example, I always say, um, you know, a love letter to someone that you adore, or a light slice of life, rarely engenders profundity. So you really want to start with the drama, conflict, tension. You know, it's, it's all it's all about the conflict, and it is, and that's all about what does the person want and what is standing in their way, and if you put that in. If, if you can have a story, your story could be not as good as someone else's story, but if you maximize that conflict, if you make that want so strong and the obstacle in the path so strong, your story will be better and they will be more, a person will be more likely to buy it and more likely to read it. 
because that is what we want to be held in by that. It's the conflict that keeps us. What's going to happen? We have to turn the page. We have to want to turn the page. And you look like you wanted to say something. Well, the, the, well sorry. No, the whole idea, the idea of narrative drive is, so, you know, it's not just this is your story. It's exactly what you're saying. Something has to keep you turning the pages. And, and I'm going to just sort of rewind a little bit for one second and scare people more than the idea of having to make it perfect as of the writing is the query letter, is that you're going to look for an agent and your material has to be so spot on, grab the reader right away with those first, that first paragraph. But the pitch letter to the agent has to be just, you know, it just has to, that it has to be a home run because otherwise they're never, you know, they're not going to see And by the way, when you're going to pitch yours to Wendy and Kim, it should start, um, you were so brilliant and amazing at your panel and I went and bought two copies of your book, Wedding Cake for Breakfast, and I looked up your, your other clients and since Claire Bidwell Smith has this beautiful memoir, I hoped you might be interested. You will never get a better beginning to an, a, a, a letter from an agent than Google them. One anecdote on that, my pitch letter. Now I'm coming from New York Times, so that's going in my headline, okay? New York Times writer. But my pitch letter, I started working on six months before I sent it out. Every time I was blocked on something, I went back and worked a little on the pitch letter. And it was all of three sentences. And which is about all it should be, three, four, or five sentences? Uh... Yeah, but the, but the nature of, of telling stories and being writers is to tell it long, and now you're trying to boil it down to a couple of sentences, Why? which is why it's so hard, and you're so right. You have, People work on their pitch letters. Sometimes they tell me it's harder to write than the book. Now, um, Peter, you're, you're an editor at Nerve.com who buys a ton of essays. How, how soon into a piece do you know whether it's going to work? Like, if you read a paragraph, do you pretty much already know? Um, I'm chronically ambivalent, so <laughs> I actually uh, stew over them for a really long time, but my sense is that um, everybody's attention is so compromised now, there's so much um, that you could hypothetically be reading, that if something doesn't, something's not arresting in the first paragraph or the first couple of lines, people are not going to stay with it. And can you give us other advice if somebody wants to break a nerve.com, which would certainly be a really cool clip? Um, is there, a, okay, so you read the site really, really carefully, yes. um, and then you said you have a couple 1,500 word essay columns, so should you emulate the style in the column? Uh, yes, that would definitely help. I mean, I, I think Jack's advice is just right. There's, there's really nothing better you can do than just really read the hell out of the place you're trying to publish and internalize it, and it's not a question of, um, you know, you always ask on these panels uh, what irritates me. And that, it doesn't irritate me if people come to me with, uh, with pieces that aren't right for us. It's not like I take it personally. It's just they want to get published, and I want to publish something. So the closer it is to the things that we publish, the better for everybody. Great. And um, final piece of advice that I want to give um, the, uh, of what helped me. I have, um, I've done eight books in the last eight years and have thousands of clips. And the thing that helped me the most, I would say, is therapy. And um, truthfully, and something actually happened um, that I found out yesterday that upset me, but it made me remember that I wanted to mention this, which is um, one of my favorite former students, Erica Kennedy. Um, I found out she passed away yesterday, and um, they're not sure, but they think that it was suicide because she was depressed. And I remember she was depressed um, because she asked me for a connection to a shrink, and I gave her a connection to a shrink, and she did see him because I saw um, her books bling. I never asked, but I saw her books bling and fashionista on his shelf, so I thought, oh great, she's doing it. But I recently found out that she didn't um, stay with him very long. And so I'm just gonna throw it out there that I'm a very proud shrinkaholic who has been in and out of therapy for 30 years, and for some people it takes three weeks, and for other people it's a lifelong process. And um, I just, you know, I think that most writers I've met, most people in this business are depressed. And, um, and my, my shrink's best advice is lead the least secretive life you can. So really therapy has, um, not only has it saved my life, people are like, how can you afford it? It has been so awe-inspiring that I actually have three books about therapy out. So I have like, so I not only have, have double paid for all the therapy, but I also, um, uh, I also can deduct it as a business expense. Swear to God, my accountant lets me deduct it as a business expense because of three therapies of uh, books. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there. And if you're not depressed, being in this business will depress you. <laughs> Good point. Good point. What comes first? And anyway, so I'd like to dedicate this book event to um, Erica Kennedy, who actually wrote uh, Bling and Fashionista, were, were really beautiful books about love and passion. 
Um, okay, so I have one more question that I want to ask all the panelists, and then we're going to open it up. So, so as Peter said, actually we'll start with you since you mentioned it. What are people doing wrong? So what's what's the biggest mistake that you're seeing? Are people like sending, you know, like a, a Reader's Digest type piece to, to Nerve.com because they're not looking at it carefully enough before they're sending it in? Are they sending you 300 word op-ed pieces? Like what, what are people doing wrong that you're saying no to? Well, something that, that's been on my mind lately is a, uh, when people have a feeling of distance from their own experiences or they don't really let you in to it. And that, I think that old, um, the axiom show don't tell, which like you hear so many times that it becomes meaningless, but it actually is unbelievably useful. And every time I say to someone, um, you know, I don't feel this doesn't feel immediate to me. It feels like you're looking at it from a distance. Um, and can you break it down into scenes and give some details and add some dialogue? Um, if they do that, it becomes you know orders of magnitude better immediately. Um, so that's huge. And, and do you agree with Wendy that you're, are you getting sucky cover letters? Are you getting like way too long cover letters? Or I always get students that are like, attach, please find my piece about divorce. And it's like, that's too vague. That's not an interesting, you know, attach, please, you know, find my piece about how I spent $27,000 on, you know, a divorce lawyer and then wound up back with the same woman. You know, like, like don't, don't you need like a, a really good description of the piece in the cover letter? I mean, it, to me, it all comes down to the quality of the piece. If it's, I'm going to look, and if it's great, I'll take it. But if you really want a great cover letter, this is speaking only for Nerve, but I, my guess is it applies. Every piece on Nerve has a headline and a deck, which is the sub-headline. Um, and the headline is usually something, they're both usually something grabby because we want people to click on it. And there's something that explains what the piece is. Um, if you look at 10 of those on Nerve and then come up with one for your piece so that I can just imagine what it looks like there and decide whether I would click on it, um, you would be doing me a big favor and thereby yourself a big favor. Great, and Devin, as, a, as I mentioned, I think Devin's a brilliant critic and he's helped so many people um, that I've sent him as a ghost editor for memoir and fiction. What, what are people doing wrong? What would, you, would you say that the, the, the David Mamet lines that people aren't really um, asking themselves um, the right questions to make the writing compelling? What, what are the mistakes I, I, you're seeing? I think that's it. I think it's the basic show, don't tell. Have the drama, chromatic conflict. It's not that people can't write, it's that it's being able to maximize your talents, because it's not just about talent. It's very easy when someone's rejected to think, oh, I'm not good enough, or oh, they just don't see how good I am. But it's about what are you showing, and, and, it's, and you are, you're, you're, you're a PR representative for yourself as well as a writer. It's, um, it's not fair, but it's just the case. You've got to have that grabby headline. You've got to get, you've got to get them interested. You've got to give them a reason to look at your writing, and then you have to write well. And that's and both of those things are completely separate from whether or not you have skill and talent as a writer to begin with. You might be happy, incredibly talented, but no one will ever know if you don't find a way to show them. And also, I would say that um, with Devin and Beth, to it, um, they, they've actually done this brilliant thing, which is taking this big platform, this big um, expertise that they have in their life, and choosing a topic that's a hundred percent. Right on target. So, for example, Devin, when you're selling a book called The Wedding Beat, does it help that you've chosen um, that you've chosen a novel where you can say, "And I wrote for years for the New York Times wedding section"? Yeah, it's not. It's not accidental. I didn't. I didn't. I just sit down, you know, when I was a young child, and say, "I want to write a book one day about weddings." <laughs> and um, it, it was what? What can I? What? It, it was. Um, I mean, embarrassingly commercial oriented. Um, although now I know there's no such thing as commercial fiction anymore. But, um, but uh, there, um, it's everything's very, very much divisions in terms of their genres. But um, it's it basically was here. What can I sell? What can I show? I have a platform for. What can I do with what? Who I am? What skills I have? What background I have? What is the most saleable thing I can do that I want to do and that I think I can do well? And I always say to students that you should write the piece that only you can write. And if anybody else could write it in the world, don't. And I remember when. Um, uh, after my shrink moved away, um, I needed a new shrink really fast, and he charged $200 a session. And so shrinks on my new 
um, insurance charge $25 copay. So I thought in order to replace him, I'm going to see eight drinks in eight days instead of speed dating and speed drinking. And when I mentioned it to my agent, my agent was like, write that down. And I'm like, why? He said, because that's Shapiroian. Nobody else in the history of the world would ever think of that. You know, so and similar to Devin, he's, so here he's a single guy um, writing about weddings for the New York Times. Um, and, and, and Gavin is a single funny Jewish guy in New York who's writing for a big newspaper about weddings. So, so that was a really good matchup. And then 27 Dresses Stole My Life. And if someone was going to steal my life, it should be me. So uh, <laughs> I'm not too. But, but it's, uh, you, you definitely want to take what you have and use it. But one thing also, if you do have aspirations to write something much less commercial, much you know, deeper, profound, sophisticated, then go for that. Just know that it's a harder path. But, and you still need to write it as good as you can, you aren't obligated to choose the most commercial angle. You just have to know what, what mountain you're climbing. Good. Um, Wendy, could you tell us, you know, obviously, um, you're a big literary agent, you get a lot of submissions, so what are the people, when, you, when you're rejecting uh, proposals, whether it's um, novels or nonfiction, what, what are people doing wrong? What do you see the most common mistake that makes you not be interested in a book? Well, this is not what you want to hear, but I don't think it's a mistake. I don't think people make mistakes per se. I feel as though every reader, whether it's an agent or an editor, is looking for what sparks them. And so what I tell people, this just isn't right for me. And so it's not like someone is doing the wrong thing. I'm reading it and I'm not responding to it. So we pass because I have to get so many people excited about it. After I get excited about it, I have to get the editor excited, who I have to get excited enough that she's gonna get her entire company excited. So my level of passion for every project has to be so high right out of the gate. And so if for some reason we're sort of, we talk about it and we're like, well, we see it, but maybe that hesitation is not doing you any service. And so by the way, if somebody sends out work to an agent, you, can mul you, you can't multiple submit to newspapers and magazines, but you can multiple multiple submit to agents until an agent says to you, okay, give me a week and I'll read it. Yeah. You can you can try 20 different agents if you want, right? Well, yes. <laughs> we like it when you come just to us, but that's not realistic these days. So I think nowadays with internet, particularly everyone does everything electronically, most writers are going to multiple agents at a time, and then when we're looking at something where it involves reading a whole manuscript, we do ask for a period of a week or two exclusively because we're going to be basically giving up our lives for the whole weekend or the whole week every evening instead of going out to read it. And so we just feel as though that's a courtesy that we want to read it exclusively. And we don't always get that. I mean, I can't say but that. Even, but even if somebody's multiple submitting, the letter, um, a, lot of, a lot of editors and agents say, if the letter is, dear sir, they're already not reading it. So, uh, so even yeah. if someone is multiple yeah. submitting, you want to feel that they Googled you and that they know what you yeah. do or they know your books. Or I mean, I'll leave so. women if it's dear sir, definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, got, I've gotten submission letters that basically that says, attached is my proposal. That is the whole thing. And I'm thinking, I'm deleting that. It's not even, I mean, it wouldn't even, cross my mind to open that file. And mm -hmm. someone has done zero effort. Now I know you're all here tonight, so that's not something anyone here would do. <laughs> but um, I don't think there's wrong, I, I don't think there's necessarily wrong. I think there's a lot of right, and I think that it's about doing your research as anything else. This is a job, it's work, and as much as you love it, and as much as I love it, it's, it's, it's gotta be done to a point of really putting the effort into to, Find out something about that agent. I was talking with a writer this morning who I just I just took on, and when I spoke to her for the first time yesterday, um, and her 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 cover letter just totally t totally got me. I mean, we were in the. Do you remember I, what it said? I really no. I mean, yes, I do, but I, I mean, I couldn't say right now. Was it that? Was it that? The description so of her book. It was just so. It just grabbed me, and I suddenly I said, I know exactly how to sell this. I know exactly the eight editors I'm going to send this to. I know who's going to publish this book. I just had that complete vision right out of the gate. Because they describe their book so well. And I got it. Okay, good. But it's the I got it part that's not the right or wrong. It's just like I got that somebody else might not get it. Um, or I may not get something that someone else gets. So when we pass on something, it may just be it's not right for, it's not right for me, it's not right for Kim. Uh, I got distracted. But. Um, the query letter, there's something about that pitch, that initial pitch that just has to 
grab you, and I think that's what we were saying. And I remember for Five Men, I worked on a long time, but when I came up with the line, it's a book for anyone who's ever wondered what happened to their first love, or second, or third, yeah. or fourth, or right fifth. And a lot of editors right. and agents said, at least I'm gonna read this now. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and Kim, could you talk about, because you, you go through slush piles, I think you told me, and when you're, you know, when you're reading manuscripts, um, yeah. similarly, like what, what are you seeing that, that isn't clicking? What should people try to avoid doing? Um, well, I think, I, think what, I think something that um, I notice a lot you know, in person, you know, I go to conferences and people pitch me in person sometimes, and, um, and I think uh, people will say something that they think is, very, is, is kind of very exciting and very kind of like, you know, my my dad was married eight times before the, you know, eight different times before the, I was 12 or something like that. And then they, and I see that they're like waiting for my gasp, I have to read that book. And I'm actually sitting there waiting for where's the narrative arc? Like, so then what happens? You know, so then do you go back like Sue and, and you, did you talk to these eight different women that your father married because you couldn't get married yourself and then at the end you finally are able to get married? Like that's a, you know, right there we have a story. So I think it harks back to a lot of the, you know, the conflict and, uh, you know, you, you set up this scene, you know, who wants what from this scene and, and, and all that. And I think um, I hear a lot of, I had a really crazy, crazy life, or craziness ensues, or blah blah, you know, and and, and it and it just kind of flatlines for me, and I'm kind of, I I can't I can't see the vision, I can't see the arc, I can't see the yeah. With a lot of editors that come, like for the Modern Love and the Lives column and um, the Townies essays, the editors say that basically what they like is they like for the narrator just start in one place, and by the end they they wind up in not only a totally different place, but in a surprising place. But so there really has to be a huge transformation. It can't just be telling a strange story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the uh, the Flannery O'Connor line. Um, uh, I, I, it's something like, I didn't see it coming, and I knew it all along. So you know, so you kind of um, you kind of have to you don't you don't throw things out of nowhere, but at the same time, you didn't see it coming because she, the, you know the tricks of the writer were, were so good and. Um, and I think that's I think that's a big you know you feel like something very crazy has happened to you, but that doesn't necessarily I think make it a book a pitch a, something shaped, and I think um, I think when someone has something that's a well crafted pitch and you know working on your cover, working on your pitch letter for six months I don't think is a good, I think that's a good idea because you really get that one shot you get a couple lines and, and that's it and you know not to. That's for a book. For journalism, they say journalism is literature with ADD. So journalism is much within a week you can you can get a piece out there. But for a book prep, book proposal, it's longer. Yeah, and I just think it's important for people to know what has to happen in order for this book to. We we have to get extremely excited. Then we have to get it to an editor who has to get very excited. Then the editor has to bring it to their ed board meeting, you know, or and and their whole company has to get excited. Then they want to have to spend a lot of money on it. And then, and then you know, it has to hit bookstores, and a lot of people have to, you know, draw themselves away from the reality television or the internet or whatever it is that they're doing to plunk down money, you know, and read your book and your voice. So that's that's a tall order. So I think um, people, you know, it, it's important to understand the journey that a book takes before it reaches shelves or Kindle or whatever, um, and and how you know, long and winding that journey is and how we're, we have to decide that we want to go on that trip with you. And, it, and actually what's great, because um, now we have Jack who works for a website, is that I always think that doing book projects which, which take so long, it's also great in conjunction to write for daily newspapers or webzines which are really fast. And, and I think it's really fun to do both together. So Jack, with Babel, um, you know, you were an editor for years. What, what were mistakes that people were making that was, um, you know, what, what were you saying no to? What were they, what were they not quite getting? I'm right for you. I, I think that um, oftentimes we, we pull up a little short of the essay we really should write. And, and something that we, we often say at Babylon, we used to say at Nerve, is that, that whatever the story is that would be hard, hardest for you to tell, that's the one that you should tell. And that's the one that everyone's going to really want to read and connect to. And your bravery is going to make it a really compelling read for, for the rest of us who weren't brave enough to write it, although we, we feel it, we connect to it. So th there's actually a writer in this room who did a piece for, for me, um, pitched a piece to me, which I took about reading her daughter's diary, uh, which I Who's that? Was, can we hear? Yeah, she, she can raise her hand if she wants. Is that who I think it is? Is my daughter here? 
<laughs> Candy Sean. Hey, Candy. It's a great, it's a great piece. Bonnie's done some really brave pieces for us too. I mean, I just think that you know, if they if they told you what their pieces were about, you'd be like, wow, you know, go girl, those are awesome. I'm so glad that you you know you were willing to tell that story. And if you read the comments to those pieces, you'll see again and again how inspiring they were, and to how many people who who might not have lived the same thing, but they lived something analogous. Um, or were just just so compelled by the fact that someone would come out and say it and share it and put it put it in public. Yeah, um, I'll shout out to two of my students here who got into the New York Times, and one is um, Alex wrote a piece about after he got back from being a vet about um, a short a short period of time um, in Afghanistan and Iraq, a short period of time where he was um, homeless. And he said it was really difficult to write about. And at the beginning, he didn't even want to say it out loud to the class. And now he's going to have to go on a road tour. He's reading it to every single class of mine. And, and, and it's easier. And Emilio wrote a beautiful piece about how he was, for the New York Times a few weeks ago, about how he was um, uh, beaten up. And his mom wound up having to take care of him in the Bronx. But instead of, as Jack said, instead of just stopping where it got hard, he actually started pouring out how their relationship had always been a little bit troubled because he was gay and he felt in the Latino culture and in his family maybe he wouldn't be that accepted. And it got, it got very heavy. And then, you, and then you got some beautiful responses, you said, from people who, um, young boys who wrote, wrote him and thanked him for being brave enough to go there because it helped them. So I actually agree with you a lot. In fact, um, Philip Lopez has a line I always quote, which is, the problem with confessional writing in this country is people don't confess enough. So I actually love that. Okay, Beth, um, I, like you, it took me quite a long time to, um, to get a book deal. Um, my first book, it was 13 years from when I started until when it was published. I say, it, it, it didn't get a book launch, it got a book mitzvah, it was so old. So what do you think you were doing wrong all that time, or what do you think kept you from nailing the book deal? Is there anything that you think, um, any advice? I actually think I didn't try. Um, did try hard enough. Yeah, I didn't try hard enough. I was writing articles, I was doing creep design and jewelry, and my first hope was always to write a book, and I didn't actually put myself out there. And I also actually started writing a different book that probably shouldn't have been my first book, and once I turned it around and talked to, I actually talked to you about it, walking around Washington Square Park, and you said, that's the book, and that was the book I started to write. And I think, really, if you write from your heart and you write what you know, then it, you know, it helps a lot, so. Great. I also learned that from Nancy Kelton, who's sitting over there. So take, by the way, taking writing classes with, you, you, were, you were starting with some first person writers yeah. who got what you were doing, so that was encouraging? Yes, you and Nancy both really helped me a lot, and that was really, really encouraging. And I will say one thing about Devin, everybody must take his memoir class, because he just made me rewrite one little three-line pitch eight times for the New York Times, and he was great. Thank you, Devin. Good, and um, Andy, what are you seeing wrong when you're getting in proposals and full novels? Um, and, and, and if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're getting them mostly in from agents. Like, you don't really want people pitching Penguin without a literary agent, but so when a literary agent is sending you material, what's, you know, what, what are people doing wrong still? Well, I think I wanted to address, actually, like, most of my stuff does come from literary. I would say 99%. But on occasion, I will look for ideas on my own. I'll troll the internet looking for bloggers. And, and like Wendy said, you're always, whatever you're reading, whatever you're hearing, whatever you're watching on TV, you're always wondering, hmm, is there a book here? And so I don't think anyone in this room would do it, but I can't tell you how many times this has happened where I've reached out to a blogger um, or a writer and we talk once, we may even meet for coffee, and then they just drop off the face of the earth. And here they are sitting with an editor at one of the big six publishers, and they're not returning emails. And, and this person is interested in that, that and the writing. This has happened a handful of times. So I feel like don't ever think that, um, you know, lightning will strike. <laughs> like, again, that's that's really lucky when you get that sort of interest. Um, and it's a small community too uh, in publishing, so you never want to burn any bridges as yeah, well. One of my editors from Tin House, he always says the biggest advice he can give is don't be crazy. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I would say, and it doesn't pertain specifically to the proposal part or the stage, it's more when, um, when your project or 
novel has been acquired. Um, talk to your editor. I think it's so easy these days to just kind of let everything go over email. I mean, we are even editing projects digitally. So we've got the software where we're just making our comments on the margins over um, on the computer, and then we just send it off via email to the author. It's very easy to not have conversations. But just today, I was talking to um, one of my authors, and I'm saying, so when this guy's getting mad, like you're just talking, you're, you're, he's saying this and that, and it sounds like he's yelling, but what's he doing with his, like, what's he doing physically? Like, what sort of space is he occupying? And is he pacing? Is he doing this? Is he doing that? And he responded, no, actually, he's, he's just standing there saying it in a very, like, steely, silent sort of way, and it's deliberate. I'm like, bingo. Like, that's exactly what you need to be bringing to this, um, to this manuscript because it's missing because all I'm hearing is, is is just this voice and to me I thought the whole time he was yelling the fact that he was saying it in a very silent steely sort of way kind of creeped me out and so if it had that effect with me imagine like what it'll do for the reader it just adds this other layer so uh, conversations need to be had I think it's very easy this day these days to just kind of let everything go over email Kim and I had so many conversations with regard to the anthology, um, not just the intro, how we were going to divide it, like who should go where, and it, it only, it just, it, the it anthology is. benefited from that. I also think that's part of the reason why writing workshops and classes and working with a ghost editor is so exciting because you can ask a lot of questions and, um, you know, it's interactive. Okay, so we're going to take questions from you guys, so anybody have a question? Um, yes, and if you want to say your name and if you're directing it towards everyone or um, one person. Okay. Um, my name is Anne Scardino and I'm presently writing a novel. And my question is for Wendy. And I wanted to know if you're, re oh, thank you. um, if you're reading something and you really like the storyline very, very much, but let's say you don't particularly like the writing, is it just a wash? You don't. Are you in our meeting today? I'm just I know. This is exactly. Yeah. This is exactly the conversation we had this morning because we all read a novel and we love the hook. We love this. We love the story that she's telling, but we didn't fall. Some of us didn't totally fall in love with the writing. We were sitting there saying, "Well, we'll have to go back to her and see if she wants to do a revision." So, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's just so good in some ways and maybe needs another shot. I mean, sometimes it's too soon. I think sometimes a writer thinks the book is ready to go and they send it out and maybe it's not ready to go. Maybe it needed one or two more rounds of their, their, their own editing and perhaps they need to bring in someone to do a ghost editing job and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. As I think Sue said, people do that all the time and I think it's smart. So the answer is no, we don't just dismiss it. Okay, and what about vice versa? If you really like the writing, but you don't particularly like the story. It, no. See, that I'm wouldn't not. be, that no, wouldn't be. No. Okay. okay, so I, the story is really the whole thing. I think it's all the whole thing, but there I are I mean, some, that's gotta be. It's all the whole thing, and you know, every now and then, and and happily it happens, it happens, yeah. it does happen, it's all just yeah. there. But sometimes it just needs a little more work, or, you know. And also, also, it depends too, because just for an example, um, with poetry or with um, like Annie Dillard's Tinker Creek, which won a Pulitzer Prize, nothing happens in the entire book, but the voice is just so unbelievably compelling that you can't put it down. But so you're dealing with when you're dealing with mystery, that's a really commercial, like a mystery novel is a really commercial genre. So so there are, you know, there are um, with poetry and and literary fiction, there are different kinds of writing where it's all about the voice, a hundred percent the voice. So it depends on you know what you want to publish. Well, I just went back and uh, rereading The Catcher of the Rye. I just thought it was really fun to read it. And I was just hysterical laughing at, at the, the writing. It's, it's hysterical. I mean, I haven't read it since high school. And I don't know if a book like that could be written today, the way it's so simplistic. Sure. Really? Yeah. I, I know, and I was going to say that's just, and that's just Wendy's, you know, that's just one agent's opinion. Like Other agents will say, no, if the, if the voice isn't there, I don't care what the story is and vice versa. Like uh, other agents will just love a voice and they'll try and craft a story out of it. So that's really just, you know, one agent's opinion and everyone, you know, feels differently. Some, um, some see something, you know, and are, are better at helping a writer craft a story when they see a voice and some, 
you know, aren't as interested in, in you know, the writing and they want a great, you know, high impact story. So I think that it's, I, I wish, you know, I, I think that um, Wendy gave a great answer for Wendy. And I think that, um, it, you know, don't, you know, another agent may feel differently. So we disagree. <laughs> and actually, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that'll make you happy, which is that I do a lot of uh, these sell your first book seminars, and what I found is that most agents that come to speak at my seminars have between twenty and hundred clients, and most of the book editors that come say that they take any anywhere from fifteen to thirty books a year. So what I love is there's a hell of a lot of slots, and it's almost like dating is that you just have to find the one person that gets you. I said it's like dating. Yeah, you got to find the person that gets you. Yeah, was there another question over here? Yes, Jim. Hi, um, I'm Jim, and I have a question for the two agents. If somebody's misguided enough to try to bypass people like you and self-publish, that it doesn't go anywhere, is that project dead to you, or is it still something you Yeah, if, something is, um, if somebody self-publishes a book, which is very common now, in fact, NYU has a new machine where for $100 you could actually self-publish your own book, I think. And um, so if someone's, Jim's question is, if somebody self-publishes a book and it doesn't do well, does that mean the book is dead in the water or would an agent ever um, reconsider? Oh, I thought Wendy was gonna take that one. <laughs> uh, um, I think that if you love a book, you love a book. So I think that there's always, there's always a way. Um, so I don't think, you know, I do think people are self-publishing more and I think that agents are paying attention to, you know, self-published books that are doing really well and, and you know it used to be if you had a self-published book and it usually it used to be yeah you the answer was yeah it was kind of kind of dead because you put it out there and it kind of didn't but um but I think if you if you fall in love with the book you fall in love with the book and you can you can find a, a home for it and you know pluck it out of the, the pile and, and um, I think it's it's an extra little hurdle to because we then have to tell the public you have to realize that we have to tell the publisher that so we might fall in love with it but then we have to tell the publisher look it's been out there it's been self-published and you know this is the track record and um, it's you know I'll tell you what I would do um, I would um, go to a ghost editor totally rewrite it get a new title and get a totally new first chapter and change the names of the characters and reinvent it that's what I would do <laughs> but, but a homely book, but it could still have, um, I mean, every book I've written has the exact, I mean, I've had fucked up relationships, fucked up substance problems, and I go to therapy. Every book I write is about that, but there's all these different ways that you could take it on. So you could take on a similar story, just with, the, you know, just do it differently enough so that it doesn't seem like it's the same book. So you could, you could act, technically, if you did self-publish, which is a subject in and of itself, you know, and you did want to then try a more traditional route, just taking part of Sue's advice there, changing the title, changing the beginning, changing the characters' names, as long as no one's going to recognize if that piece went out and you really made it work, and you really feel you just think it makes it, you think now it's going to work and it didn't before get it, you know, accepted, it's not, no, I don't think you're going to, I don't think you're going to hit that many hurdles with if it, if it's, if it hasn't been seen, if, if it didn't get, if it really didn't penetrate the marketplace. Um, if it was a non event, then it's sort of a non-event, and I think even three or four years ago, I wouldn't be saying this, but I don't think that self-publishing has a stigma today. I just think, in fact, I think publishers are looking to self-publish books. Eight, look at all the, I mean, there's, there's prizes for it, awards, right, people if are- sold 200 copies. Yeah. If it's 200, it's, I don't right, think it matters. It didn't happen. To me, that's it's it totally happen. different. It's it's happen happen to that's how so I feel. impossible, like, to go to my sales force. Yeah. My I sales agree. force, you, like, So change it. Change it. Yeah. Can't tell everyone what you have to be totally upfront and totally honest. If you've written another book, even if and you've changed it around and retitled it, and you're now sending it to me, and like you're not telling me that it was out there and it's all changed. Like, well, but if you can make it a different entity because if there's different names of characters, a different title, a different first chapter, and maybe a different ending, I think that's a different entity.
taking bits and pieces and other things that he had already written to make it into this book and call it original. Like, I, that's, that's, that's kind of but he didn't have to return the advance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Carol, did you have a question? Yeah. Ago now. Um, recently, Random House had asked me for a submission. I, uh, they like my pitch. They asked for 30 pages. Um, really, I was too rash. I shouldn't have sent it out as, as I did. Um, it came back to me, and I knew uh, it was rejected because it should have been. Uh, my question is the next step. Do I, I, I was thinking of publishing it as a short story, cutting it out, as a, make it a thousand words, and put it out in the a public place that people will see it, get an agent. Now then, do I have to um, make it a novel first? Do I send, can I have, have it sent? Okay, because you're a student of mine, so what I would do, I think um, publishing a short story is a great way to um, you know, get heat on a fiction project, but only aim very high. If it's in the New Yorker, if it's in the Paris Review, if it's in Tin House, don't don't publish it in like you know Joe Schmo West Virginia Little Magazine. Like you know, do it in a really you know, which means you have to work on it. Whether it's a um, whether that means a fiction class or a ghost editor, make it a short story. That would be great. And then don't send stuff. No matter how much a book editor wants your work, go through an agent because an agent is a filter. So what happens is if you had sent that material to Wendy or um, Kim, they would have said, you're talented, this is brilliant, do not send this out because it's not ready yet. You know, so that's what the beauty of an agent is they won't, you know, they won't send your material out that quickly. So that's, what, that's how I would start. Now, as we've said, if it's a novel, you just have to write the whole thing and make it brilliant. So you have a lot of options to do that, okay? There's fantastic fiction classes, there's fantastic ghost editors, um, like Devin, who you could pay, at not, not horribly expensive. Um, I mean, I had one that I used recently for $300. You know, so it's not horribly expensive. Um, you could do it that way. You could do it in a writing group and bringing it in, you know, bring it in every class. But you really have to have, I think you have to have a really great book before you're going to first go to agents, then go to editors. One more, can I just mention, it, it is a memoir, but it's, it, it, nothing can be exactly the quote because it ends up being exaggerated a little bit or it's my view. You're so selling that it a memoir? Yeah, I don't know. How do you define what it is, though? Is it memoir is true. It is true. You can now, by the way, a memoir. Okay, nonfiction in a memoir is true, but in a book, you are allowed to put a an author's note to explain the way that you did it. So mine in Five Men is names, dates, and identifying characteristics of many por people portrayed in this book have been obscured for literary cohesion to protect privacy, and so my husband won't divorce me. Okay, so you can it, so if it's basically true, but you just change names and details, you just you just say that up front. If it's if you've made up characters and it's really you know half of it's fiction, then you have to call it a novel. I did do that, by the way. I don't know when I had to sit down, but the forward wanted a piece of mine, and it was completely true. Change names, places, but a lawyer told them, I don't want to put it in. Yeah, we're scared we're going to get sued. Everything was changed, but they said if you said second degree murder and the date was really accused of third degree murder, then we can get in trouble. It's too identifiable, and everything was changed. So I don't know how to deal with it. I mean, every newspaper or magazine is different, but you did publish a bunch of great pieces. I would say taking a class, you know, and, and I mean, Jack teaches a class, and um, uh, Devin is teaching a class. I mean, if you're banging stuff out with a class and you know um, Kim took a class at Media Bistro with Liza Monroy who'd been published a lot so I think you don't want to be writing and sending out material in a vacuum I think if you're taking a class with somebody you trust who's been published before you could be asking questions every single week and you and you did great in my class you published some beautiful pieces yes, that's yeah. okay. other Thanks. questions yes Hi. Depends on what 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 you need. If you're moving along yes. with the draft, yes. keep going. Because I mean, and that's more in financial decision. Because in terms of, it's always helpful to get feedback, assuming feedback does help you. Everyone has a different process. But um, and let me rewind there. Feedback you need either way. But some people need it not until they're done with the draft because it'll stop them from finishing the draft. If you if feedback will help you continue the draft, 
then get it to somebody or be in a class, be someplace where you can get some input to keep you, help you keep going. If you're going on your own, get the draft out, finish the draft, have something concrete, know what your beginning, middle, and end is so you know where you're starting from as you move forward to what will inevitably be your next draft. But I'm um, also, you might, someone can come in and work with you at many different processes in, in terms of sending it out too. Sometimes after people send things out, they still use it, have people look at things. We have time for one more question. Yes. Okay, hi, my name is Stephen. I'm currently working, well, I have one book that's off with a ghost editor right now, and another book that I'm about to send out, two different books, they're two different series. And I'm wondering, and for the agents and the publisher, um, how... I think you have what, to go what, to one agent, I mean, or let's see, Wendy, what do you think? What, yeah, what do you have to do So he has two, is, 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 um, one fiction and one nonfiction, yeah, or they're, fiction. they're both fiction, but it's but they're two different books, not in the same series. Exactly. I think you have to get one agent. Yes, I, well, I think you would want to have one agent. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want one person who's your champion. No, no, exactly. But what I'm saying, if you're working on a series, how much you've said that a fiction has to have the whole book done, but if you have a series, do you also have to have an outline of the second book in the series as well? I think you need to show what the rest of the series is gonna be, but the first book, obviously, there's no series unless somebody falls in love with the first book, yeah. so that's where I would put <laughs> most of my effort. Um, I'll actually tell you a metaphor I use, because a lot of my before they publish one book, they do, uh, they try to do a series, and I say it's the equivalent of seeing somebody cute and saying, would you go out with me every Saturday night for the next four years? <laughs> I think, it's, it, I think it's too much. And so I think what you do is you sell one piece to an editor, and then if they like you, you pitch a second piece, and then once you get on a roll, then they turn to you and say, after you've done a few, do you want to do a column? And, and it, with me, what I would do if I had a series in mind, I would just focus on one book, make it really brilliant, and maybe at the end, of your letter say, you know, um, I could envision you know, going further in a series, but everybody knows if it's a bestseller, you always get another book, and if it sells 12 copies, you never do. Now, now Jake, you did columns, so, so was, that yours, um, was that your story when you started doing columns? Uh, Nerve had just started, and we didn't have any content, and um, I, I did a column because I was also the editor, and I needed things to publish every week. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know. Humble beginnings can lead you to humble ends. Uh, <laughs> great. Well, I really wanted to thank Al Yisraeli for letting us do this great event and David Varno for taping it and all these fantastic panelists. And we're going to do a little bit of a book signing. So for good book karma, everybody come buy a book and get it signed. And thank you so much, NYU Bookstore, for letting us be here. And come say hi if you just want to meet somebody. Thank you.